Hello, women in the word. So good to see you all. You're all as beautiful as ever. I'm Lynn Kitchens, glad to be here with you. Today we are looking at the problem of enemies in our lives and the fear and the discouragement that they can bring into our hearts. Okay, this summer, my husband Ted and I went to Colorado for a week, and this place we were staying had this little balcony, and we noticed there was a hummingbird feeder out in front at the edge of the balcony. And it was on a little, like, shepherd's crook, and you hang the feeder, and we got some hummingbird juice and filled that little bottle up, and then we sat back and waited and knew, and sure enough, at least a dozen different hummingbirds came out of nowhere, and we just had fun throughout the day just watching them. But, you know, the next day, an enemy came, and it was one of their own. I started looking out there, and on the tip of the crook, right above the feeder, was a little gold hummingbird. Its mission, to never let another hummingbird have a drink from the feeder. Seriously, and it shouldn't have bothered me, but I sort of got all into it. So, <laughs> I, I couldn't stand watching hummingbird after hummingbird trying to get some hummingbird. And then this, and this thing would just come out, attack them. They'd fly away frightened. They were so scared. And I thought, I'm just going to move that hummingbird feeder. And that hummingbird won't know I've moved it. Maybe the other ones will find it. Well, that did not work. That little gold hummingbird, I'd look out in the morning, there it'd be again, frightening away every other hummingbird. So then I thought, I'm going to sit right next to the hummingbird feeder, <laughs> and it'll be too scared to sit on top of the deal. Oh, no, it wasn't. And this is truly, this is what it would do. It would sit there a while, and then it would get mad at me. And it would whip around and get this close to my face and stare me down. <laughs> and I realized, I'm his enemy too. And he'd go back and then come back. Yeah, it was really scary. The feeder was filled with good things for other hummingbirds because they were afraid of their enemy, they could never get any good out of that hummingbird feeder again. And I thought, this is what enemies do to us. They keep us in a state of fear. They just make us panic. We want to enjoy life like we used to, but we're not able to because we live frightened. And so our lives begin to change. The good things we enjoyed, we aren't quite able to get to anymore. There are so many different kinds of enemies in the world that can paralyze us if we don't face them the right way. Who better to write about this issue than David? Who had enemies from the day he was born till the day he went to heaven? <laughs> David. Many enemies. Let's just remember a few of them. You all remember Goliath? David was young when this Philistine giant named Goliath came along. He mocked Israel's army. He mocked Israel's God, and David had enough of it. He looked up at that terrifying giant, and he told him this, you come to me with a sword and a spear and a javelin. I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel's enemies. And he quickly put a stop to Goliath's bragging with just one stone from his sling. Okay, then we remember Saul. During this time, there was Saul, the king of Israel, even though God had rejected him as king. And when harmful spirits came over Saul, he would have David play the lyre for relief. But Saul was also very jealous and afraid of David because God was with David. So there were times he would just try to pin him against a wall or just throw a spear at him wherever they happened to be. And so for years, Saul, as David's enemy, chased him and made his life miserable as David ran around in the wilderness from this enemy. Okay, what about all the armies that he faced? What about enemy nations that hated Israel's God and... Um, 
denied that David was the king of their choosing. They would have loved to put a permanent end to David. He was facing battles all the time. And what about Absalom? And this is the saddest enemy of David, his own son, who became his father's enemy by going to the gates of Jerusalem, sitting there day after day after day, talking about all the shortcomings of his father and all the strong allegiance he had to his people. This was his plan to win the people's hearts over and take the crown from his own father. David had to flee for his life. He was barefoot and weeping, and later he had to suffer his son's death as he died battling for the throne of his own father. Fortunately, we don't have to face those kinds of enemies today. Or do we? Are there any Goliaths out there that want to mock our faith in the world, that maybe want to belittle us? Can there be Saul's in our lives that are jealous of God's blessings that we have, that maybe misrepresent us to other people? Can there be people in situations that bring battles into our hearts that we have to work through? Can there be relatives in our lives like Absalom who break our hearts? who alter what our life is? And what about enemies out there that aren't wearing skin? You would have a list. I thought of illness. I thought of rejection. I thought of loss. These people, these situations, these conflicts and collisions in our lives can become like enemies to us because they are instigator of fears in our lives. And I think anything that causes us to live in fear can be an enemy to us. And who's the author of all that? Satan. Anything broken, anything dark in this world, Satan is the author of, and he wants them to defeat us. Look at Ephesians 6 on your verse sheet. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. So how do we overcome the fear that's attached to these kind of people and problems in our world? Ephesians gives us the answer, 616. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, which which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. God did not leave us without a plan to have an abundant life. He lays a shield of faith at our feet. But if you notice in this verse, it says we have to bend over and pick it up and go through life holding that shield of faith. Guess what? Psalm 27 teaches us how to do that. Because David did that. And so in his words, we can learn a lot how to stand strong when we're facing these hard things in our life. And I would say David faced his fears by knowing what is true, seeking what he needed, believing in what is promised. First of all, knowing what is true, we realize David faced every enemy in his life, believing that God is good, knowing that God is good. And I have to say this right now, wow, this is foundational. You want to make it through the world without the world overcoming you. You have to believe that God is good. And I really think this was behind David's faith his whole life. If we have doubts of that, we will be defeated. Fear will grow. Bitterness will await. And despair will follow all that. David knew God was good for these reasons. Look at verse 1. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Salvation brings life to the person who's sitting in the shadow of the valley of death, which is where we all were at one time. Whom shall we fear when we have been taken out of the darkness 
and into the arms of God himself. He becomes light within us. He becomes light around us. And all of a sudden, this wisdom we didn't have, we have. We have insight. We have discernment. We have truth in this world. And David's soul was assured that his redemption brought him out of the darkness and into the light. Look at 1 John 1. This is the message we've heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light. And in him is no darkness at all. Darkness is a biblical symbol of evil. Light indicates deliverance out of that evil. You know, I read this fun story about a little boy who was very afraid of the dark. And one night his mom said, hey, go get the broom off the back porch, which was outside in the back. And the little boy said, mom, you know I'm afraid of the dark. And she said, you don't have to be afraid. Jesus is there and he'll protect you. And the little boy said, are you sure Jesus is there? And she said, yes. And so he went to the back door to the porch and he, he cracked it and said, Jesus, will you hand me the broom? <laughs> he was smart. We don't have to worry about that outer darkness in our world. We don't have to worry about the inner darkness that once lived inside of us. No longer are we captured by the enemy. No longer do we blindly stumble through life like we live in the dark. No longer do our enemies have any power over us. Our redemption has taken care of that. Which leads David to something else that he knows. Why well, should be afraid when a good God is my stronghold? David rested in the reality that God was the defense of his life. We are strong in the strength of the Lord, which cannot be weakened by any foes. Our hearts and our experiences will bring some heartache. We live in a fallen world, of course. Hey, Christ had heartache when he was dying on the cross. But with God as our strength, it just has no power to defeat us anymore. The victory will always be the Lord's for those who know him. Even though sometimes our enemies will think they've won, even though sometimes it might even look to us like our enemies have won, but they haven't. Ultimately, justice will win. And guess what? We know the judge. How great is that? Look at Romans 8. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. So when we read verse 1, we realize that David's hope was fastened with a threefold cord, light, salvation, strength, which couldn't be broken. We hold on to that same cord today, and God holds on to us. Let's look at verse 2. When evildoers assail me to eat up my flesh, my adversaries and foes, it is they who stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war arise against me, yet I will be confident. Okay, so David's looking back here at experiences he had of being attacked by different enemies. Their desire is to eat up David's flesh, which is pretty gross. It means making a full end of David, feasting on their hatred, sort of like vicious beasts. It made me think about the time Jesus' enemies came at night to him on the Mount of Olives the night before he was crucified. And they're coming to arrest him. And they walk up to Jesus in the dark because that's their life, to live in the dark. And Jesus says, who are you looking for? And they say, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus says, I am he. As soon as he says those words, they fall back 
they fall to the ground, they stumble and lay there. The power of Jesus' words, the power of truth. This is an illustration of what David is describing here when he talks about they stumble and they fall. When Christians are wrestling with our adversaries and we are on our knees and then we stand up in the power of our faith, those hard things around us, they stumble and they eventually fall. And when you use the word stumble and fall together, it means complete defeat by the power of our faith. And then in verse 3, David moves from individual evil people in his life to armies of his enemies, and his response was so remarkable. He's confident facing (laughs) armies of enemies. He was certain that the same power of God that helped him with individuals would lead him to victory over armies of adversaries. Look at verse 4. David says, One thing have I asked of the Lord that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. Okay, this is interesting. He says, One thing I've asked of God that I will seek after. Okay, we've just been talking about these horrible situations surrounding him. I would think he would have... Lots of things he was seeking. Relief, (laughs) safety, victory, peace. But David knows the person with one main pursuit is that successful person. And David's pursuit is God. Spurgeon says this, Let all of our affections be bound up in one affection, and that affection be set on things of God. That was David. When David asked to dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of his life, to dwell in the house means to always be in God's presence, to feel at home in God's presence. He both asks for it and he seeks it, which lets us know we have a part to play if we want to live in the presence of God. Look at Jeremiah 29. God says, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. And doesn't that make sense? Doesn't living in the presence of God make sense when it comes to dealing with evil around us? What good does it do to live lives our way, to do life my selfish way, without God at my side, and then all of a sudden I'm in trouble? I'm going to run to God, and I'm going to ask him for his help. Running to him for his favor, but I've never been running to him for his fellowship. What good will that do me? I've been ignoring his beauty as David gazes upon the beauty of God. I've not been inquiring in his temple. In other words, his presence. You know, the Jerusalem temple wasn't built yet when David says he was looking at God's beauty there. The word temple also means shelter. And so by living in the presence of God, David recognizes he's my shelter. This is my shelter. I'm seeking him and I'm living in his presence this way because God is David's commander in all of life's battles. In the midst of his battles, it says he's inquiring of God. God directs David. David, don't do that. Do you remember all these stories of David? So I says, Lord, should I attack them? Should I run from them? Should I go tomorrow? He inquires. He's living in the presence of God. So I'm sure he told David things like, don't do that, do this. Not now, later. Don't go that way, go this way. He directs us. He mostly says to me, shut your mouth. (laughs) Don't say that, zip it. He promises to to direct us when we need him. Look at Psalm 32. I will instruct you, God says, and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eyes 
upon you. Without God's presence in the midst of our battles, we just wander aimlessly and foolishly, and we are stepping outside of that shelter. We are stepping outside of God's protection. David knew living in the presence of God provided him security during danger. Let's look at verse 5. David says, He will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will lift me high upon a rock. Okay, you notice David mentions being in the day of trouble in this verse. In other words, God doesn't always deliver us out of trouble, but he does deliver us from the despair of trouble. I read a story about Max Licato. We all know him as an author and a pastor. When he was a little six-year-old boy, he writes about his father made the mistake of letting him stay up late to watch a werewolf movie. And he said he regretted it for the rest of his life. (laughs) Max, as a six-year-old boy, became very convinced that the the werewolf lived in the den where they watched that movie, and he would not walk through it for I don't know how long. But he had to get to the kitchen from his bedroom by walking through that den. And so he would go to his dad's bedroom and wake him up if he wanted a glass of water or milk. And his dad would open one eye and say, what are you afraid of? Oh, yeah, the werewolf. (laughs) He would stand up. He would pick up Max. And Max said, with superhuman courage, he would walk me through the den of death. (laughs) Into the kitchen. And Max said, while I would be drinking my cup of milk, I would be looking at my dad in awe and wonder and thinking, what kind of man is this? In his dad's arms, Max was delivered from despair. In God's arms... We are delivered from despair, even when trouble may be as close as our den. That's what he does. It says in this verse, we are under the cover of his tent and we're up high on a rock. That means we are totally secure in the presence of God. Look at verse 6. And now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me, and I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy, I will sing and make melody to the Lord. It's still astounding what David can do. Okay, so a bowed head is a sign of a dejected countenance. No reason for David to walk around like this in the midst of his enemies, holding his head low. David holds his head high because nothing they can do to him can take away the truth that God is David's advocate. God is David's commander. And to lift your head above your enemies also means David will be the one exalted, not his enemies. And how does he respond to that truth? He worships God. You know, we aren't looking at a man paralyzed in fear here. He's singing. (laughs) He's worshiping. He's offering sacrifices. And then he's thinking to himself, looking at God in awe and wonder and saying, what kind of God is this? Sometimes it's easy to pay more attention to our circumstances. David wouldn't have been worshiping God if he had done that. When we do that, Um, more than we focus on our divine advocate, fear is always going to be the consequence. So we want to always focus on God's goodness instead of our circumstances, even if they're bad circumstances. That will help overcome our fears. So instead of waking up each morning, looking around, thinking about what our day is going to be and how hard, and we say, woe is me, That's focusing on our circumstances. We need to wake up and say, God is good. I wonder how he'll help me today. I wonder how he'll help me in this situation. 
In fact, one author put it this way. As Christians, you have to live in the middle of an ungodly world, and it's of little use for you to cry, woe to me. Jesus didn't pray that you should be taken out of this world, and what he didn't pray for, you shouldn't desire. It is far better to meet our difficulties in the Lord's strength and then bring glory to God. And when you are weary of the strife and the sin around you that meets you on every hand, consider that all the saints endured these same trials. They were not carried on couches to heaven. I thought, wow, we're in good company. Let's look at verse 7. Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud. Be gracious to me and answer me. You have said, seek my face. My heart says to you, your face, Lord, do I seek. So these verses are really about God's command and David's obedience. God commands his followers, seek my face, fellowship with me. God desires to be known, and David desired to know him from his heart. David says, my heart says to you, your face, Lord, do I seek? I'm obeying you. Now, wouldn't it have been different if David had said, my mouth says to you, Lord, I want to seek you. You know, our mouths say a lot of things we think we might do or not, and, and we don't. Things we might believe, but we change our mind. It's something else to say, it is my heart, God, saying to you, I want to know you. Our heart is the ambassador between God and our obedient actions. Look at what Psalm 105 says. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his presence continually. David did that desire to know him, and so now he's about to entreat God in prayer. So never leave me, God. Don't take your presence away from me. Remember that the Holy Spirit didn't seal believers until after Jesus ascended. And so in the Old Testament, God could remove his spirit if he thought that was best. So let's see what David has to say about that. Verse 9, hide not your face from me. Turn not your servant away in anger. O you who have been my help, cast me not off. Forsake me not, O God of my salvation. For my father and my mother have forsaken me, but the Lord will take me in. I think David cannot imagine doing life without God. He remembers God's faithfulness in the past. He remembers how he loved to serve God. And so he's saying, I don't want that to stop. He's begging him, continue to be my helper. Continue to let me serve you. And I almost envision David in these verses on his knees, his arms stretched out to God, crying out to the God of his salvation. His light, his life, God is da David's everything even over David's parents. Thought it was interesting here. David mentions the people we expect to help us the most when we're in trouble. This is our parents. And this verse here probably means David's parents have forsaken him in the way that they're just not with him. They can't help him. They're not following him and maybe not by their own choice. We don't know. So David's point is this, that he is destitute of help from those he naturally would depend on the most as a child of his parents. And so now he thinks, I'm going to look at my heavenly father. I'm going to depend on my heavenly father. And David knew his earthly father couldn't meet all his needs, but his heavenly father could. Here's what David's going to seek from God. Look at verse 11. David says, teach me your way, O Lord. Lead me on a level path because of my enemies. So kind of envision the Goliaths, the Sauls, the Absaloms, the armies, the pagans. They're gossiping, they're lying, they're slandering, they're trying to kill David. They're trying to take away his crown. They're liars. How could David deal with that? 
in his own strength, in his own wisdom. He knows he can't. He wouldn't be able to do that. On our own, our own paths that maybe we form, we are lost people. And David doesn't want to take one step forward unless it's a step from God. Because of the evil pursuing him, David asked his father, teach me how to walk. Teach me your path. You know, you've seen a toddler that holds his father's hands while they're walking. This is, this is the humility of David saying, I'm going to hold your hand. Every step I take, I'm going to let it be yours. He knows walking in the ways of God, he will be protected. And taking his own path, not so much. Think about the paths we take. I know I've done this in my life. You know, you're angry at someone or they're sort of hurting you or making you fearful. And, and your first thought is, um, how can I make that person pay for that? That's the path I'm going to get on. How can I change that person? I'm going to get on that path. I'm going to punish them somehow. David knows he needs more than just walking lessons from God. He also asks him to be his guide, his leader, and take him on God's path. It's a level path, meaning it's a wise path. We don't have to wander around aimlessly. Look at verse 12. David says, Give me not up to the will of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me, and they breathe out violence so David asked God to save him from the violent will of his enemies. They're hateful, they're lying, they're breathing out violent words about ending David's life. And so David, in the midst of their will, is seeking God's will, saying, okay, undo the violent will of my adversaries and help me through this. You know, isn't it true that we kind of, if we have people or situations in our life that are really hurtful to us, we want to watch their every move. What's going to happen next? What, could, what are they going to say? Where should I go to stop that? How can I? And guess who we're not looking at? <laughs> and so I love it. Instead of looking at their plans and the will that they have, he's turning away from it. He's trusting God with it and saying, I want your will. You handle them. I'm going to rely on you. You have capable hands. I don't. And it's always God's good pleasure to meet those kind of needs of his trusting children. Look at Psalm 32. Many are the sorrows of the wicked, but steadfast love surrounds the ones who trust in the Lord. One of my favorite hymns, Be Still My Soul, the Lord is on your side. Bear patiently this cross of grief or pain. Leave to your God to order and provide. In every change, he faithful will remain. Be still my soul, your best and heavenly friend leads through thorny ways and to a joyful end. That's our God. That's David's God. When facing our enemies, instead of staring into their face, trying to think about <laughs> what are you going to do next, what, are the, what did you say, we turn around and then we look to God's face and we share our needs about our enemies. Okay, let's look at verse 13. I believe, David says, that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. David is walking along through some very dark days, and I just think those words are so inspiring. I believe I will see the goodness of God while I'm walking on this earth. This is what happens when we look at life through a grid of faith. We are confident. Things may be falling apart around us. We are confident. We are not defeated. We know God loves us. We know he has a plan. We know he has purposes for our lives. And so we don't let our enemies be victorious. Look at Isaiah 26. 
Great promise. You keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. So while David is still walking on this troubled earth, he looked up from those things and he looked for God's goodness in this world and he looked for God's goodness in his life. And guess what? God's goodness was everywhere David looked because he believed it would be there. And that is true. Look at the top of your outline, the verse that says, taste and see, see that the Lord is good. And blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. I have often made the mistake of taking refuge in the wrong places. And that doesn't help us any. It leaves us needy. This verse says, let God be your ref refuge. So you have that peace that passes understanding. Taste and see the blessings around you. Lift your eyes above those situations. We have to do that, though, to do it well with patience. David practiced that discipline of patience to build a strong and courageous heart within him, and that's what will happen to us. And think about this. Waiting was such an important part of biblical history. We could fill pages about people that had to wait in faith in the Bible. So we know waiting has meaning. Moses waiting for the promised land. Abraham and, Isaac and uh, Sarah waiting for the promised baby. David waiting to be king. Prophets waiting for revival. And you and I waiting for Jesus to come back. There is faith attached to waiting. And so that's a good thing. It builds our hearts to courage and strength. So we wait at God's door in prayer. We wait at God's feet in humility. We wait at God's window in expectancy, knowing he's in control and at work. And this is just one of the promises God gives us while we're waiting in our day in trouble. Look at Isaiah 41. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. So remember, we talked about God providing us a shield of faith. We realize anchored in the promises of God, David continually carried that shield. We can pick up that same shield by knowing what is true about God, seeking what we need from God, and believing in the promises of God. Faith in God means to wait for his timing while trusting in these promises. Let's pray. Lord, we stand amazed. We stand in awe. How good you are. How good you are to us. I pray you would remind us of these realities and that we would come and rise above our discouragement and see your face. Teach us how to live in your presence each day. And we thank you so much for who you are. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, ladies.